I'd like to now talk about loss and ambivalence. Now that may sound like a strange topic because you would think, well, they're family, they're relatives, they should want to do this. They should be anxious to do this. In fact, they should be obligated to do this. Um, so that you know how they feel, I'm going to give you a scenario um, just to kind of give you an idea of how relative feel, caregivers may feel when um, entering kinship care. And here's the scenario. Um, how many of you have um, brothers and sisters? That means there's probably some nieces and nephews. Um, okay, there may be some grandparents in the audience. That means that they're grandchildren. Okay, let's start with this. You just got a call this morning before you came here. And today is what, Wednesday? Okay. Uh, you've been called. Today is Thursday. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's not make this week any longer. <laughs> yeah, it, it's okay if I said Friday. You can handle that even a little bit better, but not Wednesday. Yeah. All right. Today's Thursday. You just got a call this morning. And the call was from a brother or a sister or a cousin asking you to take their children into your care. Um, and it may have been because a, of a family emergency, something medical, an accident. Um, maybe there was a fire, um, one of the storms that may have occurred, but they're asking you to take their children into your home, and today is Thursday, and you have until Monday to get ready for them to come into your home. For caregivers, we're talking about them taking children in, in 48 to 72 hours. So um, I've kind of given you a little extra time. You know how have until Monday for those children to come into your home. And here's my question to you. How does this change your life? And how does this affect you emotionally? So what I would like you to do now is give me the first one or two words off the top of your head that all have to do with getting ready for these children coming into your home. Financial. Financial, okay. Stress. Stress. <laughs> okay. Space. Space. Food. Food. Work. Work. Child, Child care. Overwhelmed? Mm hmm Gotcha. How many of you have partners? Because remember, these children are your relatives. So what might you, concerns you might have related to them? Likes? Yikes. yikes. <laughs> okay, because you got to get their buy-in. So yeah, yikes says it all, that one word. Okay. How many for you would this be the first time you've ever raised children? So what does that make you feel, knowing that you're going to have them coming in on Monday? Stress again. Stress again. Mm -hmm. yeah, a, little a little nervous. Gotcha. OK. How many of you would this be a second time around? OK. So what would that make you feel? I would just jump in. I did that up like in formal kinship for a family. You're right. Yeah. Just just jump in, do it. Don't think about it. I'll deal with it after the fact. So it's just impulse. Yes. Gotcha. What else for the old timers? <laughs> so what about shock? Shock. Yeah. Not again. <laughs> Flashbacks. Sounds like trauma that we hear. We're getting symptoms of trauma. <laughs> okay. How will the rest of the family feel? Yeah. You don't have to cancel a lot of your obligate your, your prior obligations. Mm -hmm. Right. Be able to Imagine that. Yeah. First word, uh, cancellation. Right. Change in schedules. Change in routines. Exactly. Take time off from work. All right. Now let me add to the scenario. You've just also found out that an agency is involved. That maybe the removal or maybe the children coming to you may have to do, have something to do with drugs or alcohol, domestic violence. So in addition to those other feelings, because those don't go away, now what are you going to feel with an agency now being involved? First word, thoughts uh, off the top. Annoyed. Excuse me? Annoyed. Annoyed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Trauma for the kids. Trauma for the children. Uh, right. What have they experienced? Mm -hmm. Seek counseling. Seek counseling. Right. 
What else? Determination, you know, to keep the kids and the family. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Determination, protective. You want to keep them out of the system. I think scrutinized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being assessed. That's right. Yeah. Scrutinized. Perfect word. Yeah. You're being assessed. Exactly. You know, you're, you're kind of like doing them a favor, but at the same time, you're under the microscope now. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, great. I think you got it. Oh, by the way, do we have anyone in the audience that, I know this is personal, but that provided kinship care? Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, do we happen to have anybody in the audience who lived in kinship care? Even if it was a short period of time, were you with the relative? Great. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I ask that only because you're a resource to me. <laughs> All right. And it also gives you another different perspective as well, you know, that, that you can share with everyone here, please. So, all right. The reason why I had you go through the exercise is because you just identified, number one, what are the reasons why relative caregivers might be ambivalent? All those things that you listed are reasons that might give them sec provide them with second thoughts about doing it. And the second reason why I did it is because it's normal. You gave me first time immediate responses to the idea of a child coming into your home. And this is where you begin to see the difference between kinship care and non-relative foster care and adoption. For you, it's unplanned, it's by default, it's in a crisis, and it's without supports. Just those four issues right there are going to make you ambivalent. And there's nothing pathological about it. Okay, four foster parents, non-relatives, or a foster to adopt family. It's planned, they pursue it, it's with training and support. So they're not gonna have that panic attack that you just went through right now because they're kind of prepared. Now, don't get me wrong, after they become a foster parent, they go through shock too, okay? They get that call in the middle of the night <laughs> and they've got to get ready for it. But the thing is, it's pursued. They expect it, they planned for it. Well, well let me be more specific for, with you. How, how many of you plan to become kinship caregivers? Um, how many of you have thought, well, when I have time on my hands and when I have resources and when I'm ready to give back, I'm going to um, grab my niece and nephew, adopt them, get guardianship, and raise them for the rest of my life. Any, any of you thinking that way? Foster parents think that way. <laughs> Adoptive parents think that way. Kinship caregivers, it's a shock. They don't think that way. None of you are planning to get custody or to adopt or guardianship and raise a niece and nephew for the rest of your life. So that in and of itself causes you to feel shock and to feel ambivalent when you have to deal with kinship care. So here's what I'd like us to do now. What are some of those cues? And what are some of the sources of loss and ambivalence experienced by caregivers? What are some of the goals and approaches in helping caregivers live with the loss? And then what are some of the differences and similarities with non-relative foster parents and adoptive parents? You've, you've already kind of done the first part. All right, just by kind of doing that experiential exercise. Those are the sources, and what you've done very nicely is identify the reasons for ambivalence. Here's some cues you want to look for. When you're talking with relative caregivers in your casual conversations, or when you're doing assessments, you might want to be, be looking out for these kinds of phrases or statements. I'm not sure if I can do this. Is it okay with the children's parents? See, foster parents and adoptive parents, they don't care if it's okay or not okay. That's their job. They're there to take care of their children. Kinship caregivers, it's because of that pre-existing relationship and the shifts. Is mom going to say, I'm still mom? You know, is dad going to say, I'm still the parent? You know, are, are, are my other children going to be okay about me taking this grandchild in? That's what's triggering. Is it going to be okay with the child's parents and add parents, my son, my daughter, my other grandchildren, if I take that child? I don't get along with my brother or birth parent. Foster parents, adoptive parents, they, they don't care if they get along with the birth parents. But for relative caregivers, hey, there may already be tension. Now, is this going to cause even more tension? 
What if things don't work out? Can I change my mind? Sounds kind of different. Yeah, that, that's a different kind of response. OK, but if you hear that kind of ambivalence and it makes sense, you know, again, they didn't plan for this. They didn't pursue this. They don't even know if they want to do it. Foster parents know they want to do it. Adoptive parents know they want to do it. They want to be that permanency option. Kinship caregivers aren't sure because they never had a chance to even figure out whether or not they want to do it. And I only want to be a grandparent. That's a real red flag. Let's put it this way. I don't know too many foster parents that say, well, I wish I could go back and be on that waiting list to be a foster parent again. If anything, they want to get off the waiting list. They want children in the home, you know, or I've never heard adoptive parents say things like, well, I wish I could go back and be a prospective adoptive parent again. You don't hear that. But in kinship care, you do. And it's normal. And for how long? OK. How long? There's also that issue of, well, how is this going to affect my other children? Got to ask those questions, you know, because they don't know what they're bringing into the home. Drugs, alcohol, trauma, what are they exposing the family and the children to? You know, see, when we first did kinship care, we expected kinship caregivers to be like foster parents. In fact, our focus was Treat kinship families the same as you would a foster or adoptive family. And that was our approach. So when we heard these kind of responses, it threw us off. Because we never heard foster parents say, I wish I could go back to being on the waiting list. <laughs> we never said prospective adoptive parents saying, I wish, I wish I could go back to being. But you'll hear caregivers say, I wish I could go back to an aunt and uncle. Can I do this? Can I change my mind? Imagine a doctor parent saying, can I change my mind? You see what I mean? So when we heard these things, it kind of like, whoa, what is going on here? Why are they saying these kinds of things? This isn't normal. So we use the standard of foster parents and adoptive parents as our standard for how relative caregivers should respond. In fact, when we heard this, we th looked at this as pathology. We looked at this as dysfunction. They're supposed to want to do this, be glad to do this, they should be motivated to do this. And our standard was foster parents, adoptive parents. So that's why we had to begin to look at these cues differently, you know, in terms of wh where is this resistance coming from? Where is this ambivalence coming from? Expect it. And because what was happening was when we heard the ambivalence, we dismissed the kinship caregiver. We would write them off. We would not place the children with them. And we would write it up as, oh, we've got a grandparent who is resistant. I even gave them diagnosed oppositional defiant, okay? <laughs> no, they're just scared. <laughs> they're just ambivalent, you know? We've got ca caregivers who are not attached, they have an attachment disorder with their children. No, 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 they're afraid, they're ambivalent, they're in shock. Someone said trauma. So, here are your goals. You want relative caregivers to commit to the process to determine if they are a permanency option. Now, I know that sounds strange. Um, foster parents, adoptive parents, non-relatives, they already know that they want to become a permanency option. It's either a foster parent or an adoptive parent. And they commit knowing that they already want to. Kinship caregivers are committing not knowing whether or not they want to or not. They completely miss that whole first step of knowing that I want to do it. They're simply doing it, as someone said, they're just jumping in. <laughs> it's total impulse, but they're doing it without knowing that they want to do it. And here, this step is kind of like, let's go back and commit to a process to determine if this is something you want to do. Develop criteria and benchmarks because they may not know if they want to do this. You've got to come up with benchmarks that will help them to determine if they have the ability to be a caregiver and to what degree of involvement they want to have. Some are comfortable with taking them in informally, but I don't want to get guardianship, I don't want to adopt. Some are gonna be comfortable with, well, I'll take custody, I'll take guardianship, but I don't want to adopt. And it may have to do with how the family is going to respond to that legal arrangement. That's where culture does come into play. That's where race, socioeconomic status does come into play. And from some families, adoption is not an option but they're comfortable with the informal, that's their history, but then to legalize it, 
ah, oh, that's a taboo, you know. It's, it's now, now I'm competing with that birth parent. And at that point, they may say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I now going to, it does mean the children now going to have to attach to you as a parent. Ah, oh, no, I'm not comfortable with that. So the degree of involvement varies. You see, because when we started this 30, 40 years ago, we were going into the home saying, listen, we need to know that you're going to keep these children forever if they have to stay. And we need to know if you're going to be willing to formalize the relationship with either guardianship or adoption. And if they weren't saying yes to that, they were being dismissed. We were eliminating some good families simply because they weren't willing to do that. But you see, again, thinking foster care, thinking adoptive parents, yeah, they would say yes. In fact, they would think adoption was the best way. It's a way of showing loyalty. But in kinship care, you've got to look at what involvement is comfortable with them. Determine threshold on, uh, uh, determine their threshold. You know, what losses can they live with? And that may sound strange, okay, because there are going to be losses in kinship care. Retirement, freedoms, savings. Those are real losses for relative caregivers. And for relative caregivers, they don't get back those years. They don't get back to youth. They don't get back the savings. So it's about can they live with the losses? You know, is there enough benefits? And I'm not talking financial, <laughs> but are there enough benefits to make it worthwhile to live with the losses? Because that's what help relative, that's what make relative caregivers do this. It's not out of some professional development, it's not out of some career development, it's out of, you know something intangible that makes them willing to live with the losses. And when, what are their coping strategies? What are their methods? And then you've got to have an exit plan. Remember that relative caregiver said, if this doesn't work, can I get out of it? That was new for us because we weren't used to foster parents and adoptive parents saying, well, if this doesn't work, can I get out of this? If I, the adoption doesn't work, can I get out of it? For relative caregivers, it's appropriate for them to ask that question because they're ambivalent, and because they didn't know they wanted to do this, they were committing to doing something before they knew whether or not they should or wanted to. So here are your goals. First one is to normalize the loss, normalize the ambivalence. Here's your script. Your, your care managers, you're going on a home visit, you're hearing a lot of things, you're hearing those cues, those conversations. So you may need to be thinking about saying, hey, you know you should be ambivalent. You didn't anticipate the crisis. This is a decision that was unplanned, in a crisis, unexpected, so it's normal to feel that way. Don't feel guilty. Take away the stigma. Now, if you notice, when people say that they're providing foster care or they're adopting, and if it's a non-biological child, they're kind of held up in esteem. You know, they're looked at as if they're really doing something very special and very noble. But then when that person finds out that, oh, it's your niece, nephew, or grandchild, people still kind of hold you up in esteem. But then all of a sudden you get that kind of look of, well, what's wrong with, can you finish the rest of that statement? Your child. What's wrong with your family? Then all of a sudden there's a stigma that kind of goes with that. So you need to take away that stigma because a lot of times it's the reason why children go into kinship care that can cause you a stigma. Well, was it drugs or was it alcohol? Was it abandonment? Was it domestic violence? What was wrong with your kids? Why didn't they keep them? So take away the stigma. I can certainly understand why you're hesitant. You even might even continue to feel that way even after you take the child into your home. So take away the stigma that has to do with why they're coming into care. The other goal, listen to caregiver's commitment to the process. It's only fair that you have time with the child to determine if it's in you and the child's best interest to live together. That becomes crucial, even if it's an emergency placement, because I know a lot of CPS workers say, I don't have time to go through all this. You can still, in a, in, in a matter of one interview, you can say things like, listen, we need to get an immediate commitment from you to take the child. We don't know how long it's going to be, but we want you to take the child just long enough so that we can come with a plan for what's going to happen with this child and the birth family. And we want to use, also use this time for you to figure out if this is in your best interest for this child to stay with you. That's very different from coming in there saying, look, we need to have a commitment for the next six months, and we need to know that you're going to keep them if it doesn't work out with the family. Yeah, they're going to back off. But you can ask for temporary commitment, time limited, 
Let's use this time to figure out whether or not this is going to be in your interest or the child's best interest. This becomes crucial when you're starting to talk to families about, well, how did you get into this? Okay. Oh, by the way, do your assessments. Because I think your assessments are going to be very important. You know, how did you get into kinship care? How did it impact you? You know, what's your exit plan? Okay. So as managers, care managers, just do those assessments and just build that into your interviews as well. You know, um, the next part may also have to do with identifying the benchmarks. What do you need to know in order for us to know and for you to know that you can continue to do this? The benchmarks might be food, clothing, concrete things like, you know, furniture. Uh, help with IEP programs, help with schools, help with, with finances, help with legal relationships. It's kind of like what the Kinship Navigation Program here, what Ken Connect is doing. Okay, it's kind of like, let's look at those benchmarks and what accomplishments will let you know that you can keep on doing it. Well, if you can get me some beds, I can do it. If you can get, me in, get them in school, help me get a legal arrangement, then maybe I can think about doing it. Because you want them to know what they're going to need in order to feel as though they can continue to do it. Develop a process for monitoring. I also need to know when it becomes too much and when you're thinking about changing your mind. Got to make it safe for them to be able to share that with you. This is, this is prevention. Prevents them from getting to the point of a crisis where they're picking up the phone call saying what? Come and what? Get them. That's the prevention piece. You know, but you've got to make it okay, make them feel safe. See, back in the day, we were saying things like, now, if you don't keep them, we're going to come and take them from you. So we would never let them, so they would never let us know until we got the phone call. You've got to normalize the fact that you may change your mind, it's okay, and we want you to do this because you don't want, we don't want to see you go into a crisis and not able to keep the children. Make it safe for them to disclose and then help them come up with the alternative plan. That means making them know that it's okay to say I can't and it's okay to say no. It's okay to change your mind. Now let's talk about a plan about how you're still going to be involved with that family. So in summary, listen for your cues. And even if you don't hear the cues, do your assessments to give you an idea about how they're feeling about kinship care. We've got research that's telling us that how relative caregivers feel about kinship care impacts the children. Doing it simply out of obligation is not enough anymore. You need to know how did you get into it? How did it change your life? You know, what's helping you cope with all these changes? You know, it's kind of like doing a cost-benefit analysis, okay? But yeah, how do you live with the losses? What's making it worthwhile for you? Is this something you knew you wanted to do? Is this something that was in a crisis? Have you had a chance to talk about what's going to let you know? All those things I brought up are assessment questions. And then your approaches, your scripts are where your approaches. And differences, again, planned. Voluntarily pursued it, training with support. Caregivers, unplanned, in a crisis, by default. Okay. Thank you.